Welcome to the Truth and Liberty broadcast. We believe we have a mandate to bring godly change to our nation and the world through the seven spheres or mountains of influence. To further this cause, we give away a product every week that will empower you to get involved in changing your life and changing our world. You can register for our weekly giveaway by subscribing at truthandliberty.net. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to receive weekly updates on guests, news, and much more. This is an interactive live cast and we welcome your questions. To ask a question during the live cast, use the comment or chat features. Now get ready to dive into this week's topics with our hosts on location in Colorado, USA. Hello and welcome to our Monday Night Truth and Liberty live cast. Man, this is going to be an excellent live cast. We've got mm -hmm. Lieutenant uh, General, retired General Boykin with us tonight. He's He's ministered here at our place. He's been with us on Truth and Liberty before, and I tell you, he, he is a blessing. Amen. And he'll have a perspective on things tonight that I think will lend a lot of, uh, you know, credence or mm -hmm. a, a credentials, authority to some of the things that you're hearing, and I think it'll be really, really good. But we want you to participate. This is a um, live cast, so we have questions at the end. And I've got Richard Harris with me. He is our chief counsel here for Truth and Liberty. And uh, he's a blessing. He's the one that makes this thing work. Well, <laughs> And uh, so anyway, he's going to tell you some information about some meetings coming up and how you can get involved and things like that. So this is Richard Harris. All right. Well, thank you, Andrew. Hello, everybody. Yeah, we've got uh, some great things uh, coming up here at the ministry, and I'll talk about those in just a second. First, I wanted to uh, mention, if you're watching tonight on Facebook, we encourage you to watch on our website itself at truthandliberty.net because uh, sometimes on Facebook uh, they drop us uh, or censor us, and you won't. Let, that's not going to happen if you're watching on our website. So uh, we encourage you to do that. And speaking of our website, we've got a number of resources on there. We say this every week, but if you're a new watcher or new, or you haven't still haven't gone to our resources page, you need to do that because there are things on there that will help you stand up for truth and for Christ in the public square. One of our latest additions to our resource page is a pamphlet uh, put out by Family Research Council that talks about uh, sex education in our public schools. And uh, I tell you, this will motivate you to get involved in the education of your kids. Every school board in America needs to see and read that document. So, But we've got lots of resources on there. How to uh, find your representative, uh, voter guides, uh, all kinds of things. So be sure to check that out. Um, <clears throat> wanted to uh, also mention that uh, coming up, we have the Summer Family Bible Conference uh, here at AWM and Karis Bible College, and that's going to be June 29th to July 3rd, so right around the corner. And this is an event that you will love, I promise you. It is so much fun. A week full of amazing uh, Bible teaching and worship, plus fun activities for the family. And uh, uh, this, the lineup is incredible. Andrew's going to be preaching, Carrie Pickett, Bill Federer. Uh, Greg Moore, Billy Epperhart, Lawson Purdue, Barry Bennett, and Stephen Bransford, Mark Cowart, Paul, Paul Milligan, just fantastic. You won't want to miss it. Uh, and then also we have in the In God We Trust performance, which is on July 4th, which is the Saturday at the end of that week. And uh, I tell you, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing that because, you know, I think Man, now more than ever, we, we need to be reminded about who we are as Americans, about what we really believe and stand for and the things that made our nation great. And this performance will do that, I promise you. And then the Kingdom Youth Conference coming up July 10th through 11th. Uh, Ryan Edberg, Jeremy Pearson, Jacob Sheriff, and Joseph Z are the, the headliners on that. And your youth are going to love that conference. It's going to get them fired up and turned on to Jesus. So you won't want to miss that. And uh, be sure to register on our website for that. Um, every week here on Truth and Liberty, we give away a free product to uh, one of our subscribers. So if you're not a subscriber, you need to be. You can go on our website and just go up and click subscribe, and that'll make you eligible to receive not only this gift, but every week you'll get an email every week, and sometimes more than that, an update on what's going on here at Truth and Liberty. So be sure to subscribe. Last week's winner was Mary Jane Lynch, and she uh, received Discover the Keys to Staying Full of God, uh, one of Andrew's amazing teachings. And this week, our, our product is 
his Miracles in American History. Now this book was actually uh, written by Bill Federer's wife, Susie Federer, and this is another awesome reminder about our Christian American heritage and what God has done throughout the decades and centuries to preserve this amazing country. And uh, this is an amazing book. I encourage you to subscribe today so you can be eligible to receive that. Andrew mentioned that we're interactive, so uh, we want your questions, we want your comments. You can do that on the, uh, co the uh, chat uh, section of our website, or if you're still watching on social media, you can do it, uh, put your comments and questions there in the comment section, and we look forward to getting to those. I wanted to mention our membership as well tonight. Uh, we are supported by the generosity of our, our donors and specifically our members. And if you want to be a member of the coalition, a Truth and Liberty Coalition member, you can go on our website, go to the donut. Pay, donate, not donut. Donut. We don't give away donuts. Donate say, page. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> and, and go to the member option there. And for a minimum contribution of $5 a month or more uh, on a regular basis, you can become a member and we'll send you a free gift in the mail. So uh, we thank you for your support. Remember that all of the donations to Truth and Liberty are not tax deductible because we're a 501c4, not a 501c3. And last tonight, uh, if you'd like someone to agree with you in prayer, someone to agree in faith, according to God's word, we have the people lined up to do that. Just call into our phone center at 719-635-1111 and you will be blessed. So tonight we are really blessed to have Lieutenant General uh, Jerry Boykin with us. And he spent 36 years in the Army, and he was an original member of the U.S. Army's Delta Force. He eventually wound up commanding the Army's Green Beret. He taught at the Special Warfare Center in school, and he is now the Executive Vice President of uh, Family Research Council. I hope I got all of that right, General, but you're a blessing. You did. Thank you very much, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be with you. And you've been with us a number of times here as well as on these live casts. And I tell you, you are just a, a voice of reason when it seems like very few people are thinking very logically. So I'm excited to have you on tonight. It's really good. So let me start by just, uh, you know, there's a lot of things we could talk about with all of the riots, the protests, the killings that are going on, the defund the police, taking over Seattle, and on and on. Um, man, it seems like that the people are just totally crazy. Is this actually mainstream America, or do you believe that they're taking advantage of these situations and there's some nefarious people working behind the scenes? Well, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I think that this was, if I can say this and people understand, it was a perfect storm. We had uh, we had this COVID thing going on and people were told to shelter in place. People had been in their homes for weeks and really not able to get out and do the things that they wanted to do. And there was a great deal of pent up frustration. And then you had the killing of George Floyd uh, and it's videoed and it's proliferated by the media uh, which just inflamed the passions of more people. Uh, and people got out for really for some justifiable reasons as, as they reacted to the killing of George Floyd and what they saw in those videos. But then you had these very nefarious elements like Antifa and may I say also Black Lives Matter because remember, uh, Black Lives Matter is the one that said, uh, what do we want, dead cops, when do we want them now? Uh, they had targeted cops in the past, but Antifa is really the bad actors here. And this is an organization that you've got to do a little research to find out who these people are. Uh, and they go all the way back to uh, really to Russia, to the communist Russia back in the 30s. And uh, they really got a foothold here after Ferguson. Uh, and, and they are connected to an organization called the Revolutionary Communist Party U.S., not to be confused with the Communist Party USA. And, uh, and there's a tie between Antifa and this organization. They are hardcore Marxist and anarchist. And that's what you're seeing now. Bricks don't just show up in a, yeah. in a big pile by themselves. They don't fall out of heaven. Yeah. It's not like manna in the desert. Uh, they are delivered there because they have already been stockpiled in various places around the country. And that's what Antifa has done. And they came and stirred the passions of these people 
And uh, you, you probably would have seen more peaceful, generally speaking, more peaceful protest uh, had it not been for the Antifa and, and some others uh, that were on the radical side that uh, really stirred the people up. And, and now look what we've got. Well, General, I know that there's people watching this who they've heard people speculate about this, but I haven't heard anything that's real definitive and so let me just ask you, are these your opinions or do you, because of your connections and position, have any inside information or anything that makes this direct connection? Yeah, I am uh, tied into several uh, different uh, organizations with people that are tracking this very closely. And uh, we do conference calls uh, several times a week to where uh, they explain to us what evidence they have, what they have uh, discovered in their investigations and that type of thing, so that we could be informed as we do uh, media programs and that type of thing. And of course, I'll cross-reference the things that I've just said to you. And I think there is absolutely no questions that at the, at the roots of this is the Marxist movement within America. And Antifa is right now the action arm for that. So if this is true, why doesn't the government, some of like the CIA, FBI, or somebody, why don't they intervene if they know that this is actually subversive towards our government? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is keep in mind that in, in, in counterinsurgencies, and we do have, this is an insurgency. Uh, what the insurgency is trying to do is get the government to overreact so you lose the popular support of the people. I mean, that goes back to Vietnam, Andrew, you were there. Yeah. And, uh, and, and and that's what the Viet Cong were trying to do was get the government of uh, South Vietnam to overreact so that the people would turn against their own government. So that's an issue and you've got to be very careful with how you deal with that. The second thing is Antifa has had a lot of years to prepare for this, this very thing, uh, this type of thing in, in America. And, uh, and, and they don't expose their hand readily. So there's an investigative, a due process, uh, you know, issue here associated with uh, being able to determine exactly who you go after. But, uh, but we know that Antifa is the foundations of the nefarious acts that are taking place here. So let me ask you another question, like in Seattle, um, you know, they've just, it's totally against the law to occupy public property. I've heard that it's affecting the uh, response time of first responders and that, you know, it could cost somebody their life and things like this. And yet the mayor just saying that it's a love fest and she's going to let it go on. And so President Trump is saying if they don't take care of it, he will. So what rights does President Trump have to intervene in a local situation like that? Yeah, this goes back to what we saw last week or the last couple of weeks uh, in terms of the president's uh, true authority. Uh, the president actually can activate the military, the, the active duty military, and he can federalize the, uh, the National Guard. Now, it's called the Insurrection Act. It gives him the authority to do that and to use them in a, uh, in a civil law enforcement role. Uh, normally, that is to restore order. Uh, that insurrection act goes all the way back to Thomas Jefferson, hmm. 1807. It's been modified several times since then. But, you know, uh, I operated under the Insurrection Act once, uh, and that was at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary in 1987, where the, uh, if you remember, the Mary L. Boat Lift, Jimmy Carter's big... Uh, refugees. Yeah, his, his rescue of all the prisoners in Cuban jails. Uh, and when they got to America, uh, most of them were locked up in two places, mm. uh, the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary and the Federal Penitentiary in Oakdale, Louisiana. They rioted and took hostages in Oakdale, Louisiana. And all of the FBI SWAT teams rushed down to Oakdale to take over the prison. The next day, they rioted in Atlanta at the Federal Penitentiary and there were no SWAT teams. So Ronald Reagan uh, signed the Insurrection Act and we went down and took over the, the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary until we got the hostages out and eventually evacuated all of the prisoners in there. So, uh, and George H.W. Bush, the last time that I could find that it was used was uh, George H.W. Bush in 1992, but it has to be a last resort. I mean, it really has to be a, a desperate situation 
before you put active duty military. Andrew, nobody, nobody that I know of in the military wants to be uh, put into a law enforcement role inside the United States. Uh, that is fraught with problems, and that's what Americans fear. They fear, you know, uh, having a, a military turn loose on the on the public, and and that is uh, that's a that's a tough thing. But keep in mind that on a daily basis, the National Guard, except for the National Guard in Washington D.C., the National Guard is under a different title in the U.S. Code. It's under Title 32 instead of Title 10, which is the active duty military. They work for the governor. The governor can deploy them to restore order at any time, anytime he wants to. Uh, and these governors, by the way, generally have been pretty slow in doing that. And Washington, D.C. Is, is different because it's not a state. So so it's actually the president that, uh, that has uh, command authority over them. But they're different than the other 50 uh, National Guards around the country. Uh, that said, the president has to consider in any situation like what we're going through right now, he has to consider the option of having his attorney general bring him the Insurrection Act for him to sign and to use active duty military. I don't want to see that happen. No. I think that the National Guard is fully capable of restoring order. It just requires leadership by the governors and the mayor. And I must say, Andrew, I think there is a lack leadership in uh, some of these cities where there's been so much rioting and looting. Well, you're saying that it has to be a last resort. How desperate would it have to be to justify using this Insurrection Act? Well, I don't know how to quantify that. I think in, in uh, Seattle, we may be coming to that point. I think we may be coming to the point where uh, there are lives at stake here. There are, there are people at great risk there. Uh, because of the inability of first responders uh, to be able to get in there. And, you know, people live in that six block area there. It's not just a bunch of stores and boutiques. People live in that area as well. And they are literally being held hostage inside the perimeter that's been established there. So I don't know exactly how to quantify what would be the last straw. Where would the president finally be pushed into uh to using uh, his powers under the Insurrection Act. I don't know where that line is drawn. I'm sure he and his advisors are discussing that right now. And you know, not only would it set a precedent of using the military against their own people, which nobody wants that, but man, politically, this is something that the Democrats would jump on and it could be an issue in the election. And I tell you, there's just so many things going on in our nation right now that could totally flip all of the progress that we've made during the last three years. It's a critical time. Well, I think you're absolutely right, Andrew. And that's, a, I, I think that part of the, part of the objective here by these uh, insurgents uh, is to prompt our president to push him to the point where he does something that they can then use against him. Mm. And of course, everything that he does uh, is, is used against him in the media and yeah. by his critics. But uh, he's got a, he's walking a very, a very tight line right now in terms of responding to all of these things. And uh, I, uh, well, we need to be praying for our leaders in this Amen. country. Let me go back to something you said earlier. You gave a quote from Black Lives Matter that I hadn't heard before about uh, something about that they wanted uh, dead policemen and stuff. Do you remember what you said there? What do we want? The response was dead cops. When do we want them now? Pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. And that was a statement from an individual or was this somebody representing that Black Lives? One of these Black Lives Matter meetings had. Wow, I hadn't yeah. heard that. You know, one of the things though, I, uh, I don't doubt that there's people who are racist and just hate people because of the color of their skin. But the reason that I haven't come out and just endorsed Black Lives Matter, and I've lost a, a number of our uh, African-American partners saying that I didn't go far enough. I said that George Floyd was murdered. It's wrong. And the police need to be, um, something needs to happen so this doesn't happen again. But that wasn't enough until I bow the knee and totally endorse Black Lives Matter. 
But without knowing that statement, one of the reasons I haven't done that is because it's the Black Lives Matter that is wanting to outlaw police. And they're just painting with a broad stroke and saying that everybody is racist. And I think that that is racist in itself. They're prejudging people, not based on what's actually happening, but they're just lumping people into these groups. So I think that, uh, you know, although there may be people who are sincere and it started out with a justifiable cause wanting some things to change that, man, it's being fanned into this could become a race war in America could undo a lot of progress that we've made. How do you think? Well, think um, if, if you look at America today and what it was, uh, you know, when I was born 72 years ago and I grew up in the South and I grew up in a racist environment. But you know what? Institutionally, I do not believe that there is institutional racism in America. There are racists. That's right. There are racists in every society. There are racists. But institutionally, I do not believe America is a racist nation. Now, we still have problems that need to be worked on. And the killing of George Floyd was 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 horrible. Yep. And it has to be dealt with, and, and somebody's got to be held accountable for this. And I don't know much about this shooting in Atlanta yesterday. What I saw on tape, I didn't like. It didn't look very good to me. Uh, and, and I believe that there are lots of people in the Black Lives Matter movement that are very sincere in wanting to prompt change, wanting to at least have their say. I believe many of them are very, very sincere. You cannot let this get out of hand, and you can't indict all America because of what some really bad people have done. Absolutely. And I, that's what I see happening, and it grieves me. Andrew, you, you took an oath to the Constitution of the United States. You went off and fought a war in a foreign land. You, like me, you have made an investment in this country. And it grieves me beyond what I can even explain when I see what's happening in this country after— uh, serving this country and and wearing that flag, uh, I am so upset by what I see happening right now. And again, this is where it takes leadership. And I think the when I look at what the president is doing, I, I think I'm glad I'm not in his shoes. Yeah. And, you know, some of these partners that just uh, came out and blasted me, said I'm a white supremacist and stuff like this. They started their email by saying, you've changed my life. God used you. you. You have affected me more than anybody else. But because I didn't bow down, because I didn't promote Black Lives Matter, then I'm a white supremacist. Mm -hmm. And this is damaging that they won't listen to anybody else. And... Uh, it's just irrational. And defunding the police. Man, you've been a part of the military where it's all based on law and order and following guidelines and stuff. To think that people want anarchy and no police, I can't even imagine how a, a sane person would support something like that. That's got to be completely insane. The problem, as I see it too, is that there is no dialogue on this. You can't you can't sit down and talk about this in a rational kind of way, and and you see, I mean, you see if you, if you watch any of uh, YouTube or anything, you see people out there saying, uh, "Why are you here?" and and the the reasons that they're there uh, wind up in a shouting match. Yeah, and, and there are sincere people out there that really want to prompt change, uh, as it, especially as. Uh, with regards to uh, the police, but the, the data, the facts show that there are quite a few more white people that are killed by police every year than black people. But those, those figures, that data does not make any different, any difference uh, when you have people out there that are, are so emotionally charged that they're not willing to engage in a real dialogue on this. Yeah. I just was on the internet uh, yesterday, I think it was, and I saw that there have been 277 whites killed by the police in 2020 and 88 blacks. So statistically, there's actually more whites. Now there's a smaller percentage of blacks and uh, you know, you can adjust those and this is what people are doing. They're taking stats and 
and manipulating them. But when you have a million plus arrest per year, <laughs> you are going to have some people who do it wrong. You're going to have some racist cops. And if you just take any instance of racism and blow it that all cops are bad and that all of this, uh, there's no way to keep uh, sanity in this nation. People are going to have to start waking up and realizing that's, that's just unjust to paint every single person as a racist. Well, I don't know if, if, you, if you have uh, somebody put together a thing for the internet to show videos of some of the things that policemen have done. And the one that really uh, grabbed my heart was uh, a, a woman with a, an infant and that infant swallowed something and was choking and these, I mean, they had police cars just piling in and these police were giving CPR. They were doing everything they could and they finally revived this baby as this woman had just melted down. I don't know if you've seen that, but it, no. will, it, will, it will grip your heart as you see this, but that kind of thing is forgotten. When you have a, a situation like the George Floyd situation, it, those things are forgotten. Yeah, and uh, nobody is justifying what happened to George Floyd. Of course, I wasn't there, but the video that I saw, it just, I can't see any justification for that. But I have heard of at least two black police officers that I'm aware of that were killed during these riots. And nobody says a thing about them because it doesn't support the narrative. It's, it doesn't show racism from whites towards blacks. And so they... They don't mention those at all. And so again, I'm not again, I've got good friends who are blacks and that, you know, I can understand they came from a different situation than I have. They may have it uh, uh, be more sensitive because of things that they've endured. But man, we've got to quit blaming all police and all whites for just, you know, institutional racism. I agree with you 100%. I don't think it's in institutionalized, it's just evil. And you know, a good friend of ours, E.W. Jackson, you told me that he's a real good <laughs> friend of yours. He's a black man and he just spoke for us last week. And I tell you, he, he just cut to the chase. He says it is not black and white. He talked about how that they've in, the Europeans enslaved each other. Indians enslaved. There was more percentage of slaves among Indians than there was of Europeans that came here. He says it's just evil. And there's always going to be evil. And to make it a white and black thing is just, it's wrong. Hmm. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, uh, and E.W. takes a lot of criticism, too. But, he does. But look, he is guided by, uh, by something other than uh, the secular notions. Uh, he is guided by his faith in Jesus Christ. And he is, uh, he is bold, takes a lot of criticism, but he still keeps getting up every morning, putting on his armor and getting back in the battle. He's a blessing. And so did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, I had a question. Uh, uh, General, you had, you'd mentioned Antifa and it's a Marxist organization. Do, do we know where they're getting their funding? Uh, yes. Uh, well, we, you never know where all of it comes from, right. but they are... Yeah, there are th about like three organizations that fund most of the these kinds of things, and obviously one of them is is Soros. But you've also got the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and there are a couple of others like that that are big money foundations that uh, uh, they go around and put uh, put a lot of bucks into organizations like this. Um, I have actually seen uh, some of the money trail from one of these investigative reporters that, uh, that I've talked to, uh, but I don't have that data with me right now and I'd hate to say something that wouldn't prove to be accurate. Yeah, well, th there is some good news, I think, uh, in the headlines at least a few days ago. The president signed a pretty important executive order on religious freedom. Uh, uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah, he did. Uh, he signed it a couple of days ago, I guess, in, uh, or last week. Uh, and uh, today, I think HHS was going through it to develop uh, the implementing instructions and and be able to explain it to uh, to the public. But basically, what it does, it goes back to Obamacare, where you were not able to opt out as a health care provider or a health care institution 
You weren't able to opt out of certain things that you found objectionable. The main thing was uh, had to do with uh, transgenderism. And uh, there were uh, doctors and hospitals that just simply did not want to deal with the issue of, of uh, surgery for transgenders or this what they call transition surgery and, and other things associated with uh, transgenderism. So uh, what this executive order is going to do is it's going to give relief to the medical workers and the hospitals and the institutions uh, that have uh, conscientious ob objections to uh, being involved in something like that. And since it's an executive order, this means it's not a law. So if Trump wasn't reelected, he could just be wiped away with the stroke of a pen? Is that correct? It could be rescinded uh, with the stroke of a pen. That's correct. Man, we need to participate. Uh, yes, this is a critical, critical time. You are also executive vice president of Family Research Council. Would you tell our um, people that are watching this a little bit about what your position is, what Family Research Council does? Thank you, Andrew. I'd be delighted to. Uh, the Family Research Council was really uh, a creation of uh, Dr. James Dobson many years ago, over 30 years ago. He wanted a Washington presence. Uh, for focus on the family. Now, we're now separated from him and have been for about 20 years, uh, but he's still a delightful friend of ours. But uh, we are just what we say. We do research, and uh, you can find research on all kinds of things. You can find research on the biblical worldview. You can find research on human sexuality, on families. But our research is focused on faith, family, and freedom. We are a both a 501c3 and a 501c4 uh, organization. So we can endorse candidates under our C4 heading and provide funding to their campaigns. But also about four years ago, we created a religious liberty center. We decided that uh, we were fighting so many battles on religious liberty that rather than doing it ad hoc, we needed uh, an, an organization within Family Research Council that would put us on the right footing to be able to really fight this issue. So we created a, a religious liberty uh, center, uh, and the vice president for that is a Naval Academy graduate and a lawyer uh, and a, a, just a great man. And uh, we're really building a team around him. And uh, we are out there every day fighting religious liberty to include in our military. Uh, because there's a huge problem that started in the last administration with uh, the infringement of First Amendment rights on uh, young men and women serving in uniform. So we fight that as well. Uh, and we have a pastor's network. And then the, our latest creation has uh, been a men's conference or a men's network. And uh, I just released a book in April called Man to Man, uh, which is really talking about what God has called men to be. And, uh, and we built conferences for men around that. We've been on a little hiatus with this COVID stuff, but next month we're heading to San Antonio for a big conference there and in Baton Rouge. And, and, and we're trying to rally the men. And Andrew, uh, you know, I was on with, uh, I was on Fox with uh, uh, Neil Cavuto the other day, and he, he said, what, what do you see? that's happening here in the country today. And I just looked at him and I said, my question is this, where are the men? Where are the men in this country today? Where are the men that ought to be out there pulling their sons and, and their neighbor's sons off those streets and saying, you, you, you march yourself back home. Yep. You, you shouldn't be out here doing this. You I heard somebody make that comment today when I was coming in. They said, these people that are occupying Seattle, where are their parents? They mm. need to go tell those kids to come home. Mm. Yeah. yeah, Especially the dads. Where are the dads? Where are the men? Yeah. So that's our latest creation. And we're, uh, we, we just, uh, we're really excited about, uh, we've already run about six of these conferences. And we're really excited about that. We're seeing a tremendous response from men who really, really do want to get it right. Uh, but they need mentoring and they need guidance and uh, they need to be motivated in many cases. We just so, had one of your people from Family Research Council that was at our Truth and Liberty Conference last week. And he came up and asked me if we could 
uh, if uh, our facilities could be used for one of your men's conferences. And I said, oh man, that'd be great. So hopefully we'll get you and Tony yeah. to come here and, and we'd love to have you have a conference. That here. was our director of men's ministries, uh, Randy Wilson. That's right. And so that's yeah. a blessing. So also Tony Perkins uh, is there at Family Research Council and also Michelle Bachman. You've got some pretty powerful people right there that are lobbying and I know that Tony, he has uh, interaction with the president on a regular basis and has uh, actually influenced some of his decisions for religious liberty and stuff. So you guys are making a difference. Well, he, you know, Tony will tell you that uh, in the 20 years that he has been with Family Research Council, he has greater access to the White House, to the president, uh, and greater influence with this president uh, than any president since he's he's been with Family Research Council. And look, I'm not telling anybody who to vote for or anything else, but I will tell you this, for, for us at the Family Research Council, he has been the most user-friendly president that we have had. Yeah. And he's taken things very seriously, like this executive order on religious liberty. But he's also moved the embassy and he's he's given us a, a number of things that were really fundamental to uh, us being able to continue to practice our faith. And I think that uh, I think that what you're seeing now is the veil is coming off of the of the other side because of the way churches have been shut down and and the way that people have been arrested for sitting in their car in a parking lot of a church on Sunday morning, listening to a sermon on the radio as the pastor stood on a platform yeah. and people will get arrested. Uh, the veil has come off on a lot of these people and our president may be the last line of defense on this. You had mentioned a book that you've just written. I think it was titled Man to Man. How do people get hold of that book? Well, I would tell you to go to Amazon, but uh, Amazon they run out of books so fast uh, and they're focused on shipping other things at the, during this COVID crisis. So either Barnes and Noble or, uh, or books a million will get you a book a whole lot quicker than going to Amazon. So can they get it through family research council? You can order them through family research council. Mm -hmm. Yes. FRC.org is our website. FRC.org. Amen. Excellent. So we've got just a few minutes before we start taking some questions. Is there anything else hot issue that you want to mention while we got you? Well, yeah, I, I'd say the only thing is the obvious. It is the uh, elephant in the room. And that is that uh, now is a time when Americans, uh, Christians ought to be really pressing into the Lord. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you, this is, uh, and I thought I was a mature Christian. But I've spent more time reading my Bible and praying since this started than at any other time. And I feel my relationship with the Lord now is stronger than it was prior to this. And we all need to be, we really ought to be in the Word and on our knees and, uh, and, and trusting the Lord. Don't look at today's situation. Look beyond that. See through it and realize that uh, ultimately God as the final say. Well, you know, I think one of the reasons we're in the mess we're in is because the church has not been engaged. They've just been right. thinking about their church services or going to heaven or something. And so we need to get involved and we need to stand up and, and I'll probably lose a bunch more partners because of some of the things I said tonight. But you know what? I don't think I've said a single thing wrong. And unless Christians begin to stand up and begin to push back against some of this insanity, uh, if it doesn't get challenged, people just go with the flow. Right. We, we got to stand up. I think it's imperative. I don't, I don't have any uh, claim to be predicting the future, but I think that we are at a tipping point. Mm -hmm. I think President Trump has done more good for this country than any president in my lifetime, especially for the church. The economy was booming and then we have the virus and now we got the race relations things going and it is, the devil has been flushed out into the open. He's throwing everything he's got at us and I really think that this could make or break this nation for a long time to come. So it's a critical situation. I totally agree and you know, Bible sales are up about 52%. 
and uh, you know people like Greg Laurie and their uh, the feedback they're getting from their online sermons is uh, people are coming to Christ in record numbers. So it's, this may be a revival by a, you know under a, a a different way, a different method. But I think that uh, I think there's lots of people that are coming to know Jesus Christ as a result. Of this. Well, what crisis does? It takes people who are just going through life and not paying attention, and it lets them realize that man. Uh, we need the Lord. We aren't going to make it on our own. And so it just heightens the need. The need is always there, but people aren't always aware of it. So yeah. it's a good time and the church needs to stand up and take advantage Absolutely. of this situation. It's awesome. So, all right, so let's take some questions. Did we get any questions? Yeah, we've got a lot of questions coming in. Uh, General, here's the first one um, and it's uh, from an unnamed guest, but this person asks, how is America going to heal, become unified, and what role does the church have? Are you seeing any signs of hope? I think you touched on that, but how can the church lead in the healing process, especially on the race issue? First of all, I think the church is being purged through this. I think it's exactly what Andrew said. Those churches that have been focused on brick and mortar buildings and, uh, and not on building the kingdom of God, I think those churches are, uh, some of them are just gonna disappear. I think a lot of them aren't, aren't going to re survive this. But I think there's a lot of others that, uh, that they let the Lord lead them in, 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 in doing new things and, and being what the church should be during this period of time, which is a beacon. They ought to be out feeding hungry people. They ought to be taking care of the sick. They ought to be out there spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think those churches are going to grow. And I think those ministries, I say churches, I really mean ministries that, in, as a whole. So I think they're going to grow. Now, the challenge for pastors is there's an awful lot of people who have come to Christ online. So for, for your caller there, you ought to be out now looking for somebody that you can disciple that has come to Christ, but has never been in the, the, the door of the church. Because when this the things do start to smooth out, that person needs to be discipled. And that's one of the things that we ought to be doing well, I'll be looking for people that we can disciple because the Great Commission uh, in the end really was making disciples of all nations. With. So we need to be looking uh, for how we can get out and start really making, you know, helping these people to know what it means to live the Christian life. Man, that's the heart of it right there mm -hmm. that the Lord told us to make disciples and the church has been making converts. I can guarantee you there's a lot of people that are involved in all of this who claim to be Christians, but they are not disciples and they're allowing the devil to use them and cause division. 100 percent. Yep. Seeing it every day. Yep. That's very good. Well, General, there was a Supreme Court case that came down today uh, holding that the word sex under Title VII includes um, sexual orientation and gender identity. So they just made it illegal for businesses to uh, take any action against uh, uh, like say a cross-dresser or a transgender individual, maybe even if they're in the public uh, light for that business. Um, and uh, we have a question from a viewer that asks, uh, can you comment on this case? Um, and what does this mean for uh, the military? Yeah, well, I don't think the impact on the military is known yet. I don't think that, the, you know, President Trump has uh, banned transgenders from uh, enlisting or being commissioned in the military. Although, and rightly so, those who came out as transgender under the Obama administration were allowed to stay in because their government told them, if you'll come out, we'll let you serve. So you can't, you can't go back on that. But uh, I don't know exactly what it's going to mean for the military, and that's going to be something the DOD and the Department of Justice are going to have to figure out. But what does it mean for the rest of us? Well, it means that we're going to continue struggling with this issue of, uh, of, of whether we are going or we are being forced to celebrate uh, how people have sex or how people feel today rather than what their birth certificate says or what their, uh, you know, what they were were born to be genetically. Uh, so we're going to continue to struggle with this, but I don't think this is the end of it. I think the fact that Gorsuch jumped in with Roberts on this thing today, you're going to see this challenged again. And it's only a matter of time and you'll see it challenged again. Now, if Mr. Trump is reelected, there is no question he's going to get another uh, Supreme Court justice appointment, uh, at least one. 
and uh, and I, true to true to his form to this point, he's going to put a conservative in there. Uh, Gorsuch was a huge disappointment, but uh, but we it, it's yet to uh, be determined as to how it will impact the military. I guess this is also going to mean that, like, if uh, one of my employees felt like a woman that day, mm -hmm. they could go into a women's restroom, and if I take any action, I would be in violation of this law. Is that the yeah. way it works? I think that's one of the issues that is going to come up, for sure, uh, 100%. You all just come visit me in prison because I'm going to do what's right and protect our people, <laughs> and I'll have a jail ministry if I have to, but I'm not going to change. Well, you know, in follow-up on that, General, do you have any concerns that the LGBT movement and activists that are behind this, that their real target might be to, to uh, silence the pulpit on this issue? Yeah, and they've done a pretty good job up to this point on it, haven't they? That's I mean, a shame. That, yeah. I mean, look, I, I, would, uh, I would say go around and find, find a pastor that's, uh, that, that's given a biblical definition of, of a man and a woman. For marriage, go around and find a pastor. Do Andrew, you're you're rare. You're I just rare. I told our security people if somebody wants to do that, just pull their pants down and check their plumbing, and that whatever <laughs> plumbing they got, that's who they are. <laughs> now, of course, I don't literally want that to happen, but I mean, we're going with the biological thing. I don't care how they feel. Well, no, that's exactly right. But he, he, but here's the other thing, and we cannot overlook this because we saw it. When all this started, there are predators who will use that. Absolutely, there are predators who will use that, and and I see I see that this is very much uh, a lot of this can be blamed on the church though because there is there is truth and then there's 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 untruth, and we know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is truth, but we know embedded in His Word is an awful lot of truth. And God made them man and woman. Absolutely. Yeah, and He didn't. Uh, he didn't equivocate on it. He made them man and woman. And look, I feel sorry for people that are suffering from gender dysphoria. I mean, I really do. I have a, I have a soft spot in my heart for them because I know that it's got to be very difficult. But at the same time, I know the truth. I know what God's Word said. I have a biblical worldview on this issue, but very few Christians. George Barna says less than 9% of the total population in America has a biblical worldview, and it's dropping. Yep. And this is one of the fallouts from not having a biblical worldview, is that you don't know what the truth is about this. It is not a matter of how you feel. It is exactly what you just said. When you came out of the womb, Andrew, the doctor did not say, oh, it's Andrew. <laughs> he said, it's a boy. That's it's exactly a boy. right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And there's only one way to know that. And again, free, a Family Research Council has a lot of biblical worldview material on their website. Mm -hmm. And then I'm starting a series on biblical worldview in just a month on my television. We've got a brand new series, 12 parts coming out. We just hired... Alex McFarland. I don't know if you know Alex McFarland. I know Jim. Alex well, yes. Well, we just yeah. hired him, and he's going to bring biblical worldview into Karis Bible College, and we are going to provide people with a biblical worldview on all of these social, moral issues. And so we got to speak it's out. It's going to be powerful. It'll be really Great good. Choice. So you got more questions? Yes, sir. Well, uh, the next one, uh, Lyle on, uh, on Facebook asks, uh, I read that President Trump said he was going to declare Antifa a domestic terrorist organization. What uh, consequences will that have in fighting uh, against this insurrection? Yeah, technically, we don't even have a list of domestic terrorist organizations, but it's uh, his. He, what he's thinking is absolutely right because if you look at our list of, uh, of, of foreign terrorists, anybody, any organization caught providing any kind of funding or material support to them is liable for a prosecution. So if we get them on a list as a, as a domestic terrorist, theoretically anybody that puts any money into this Antifa organization can be held accountable in the court of law. 
Man, that would, you dry up the money, you're going to dry up a lot of their actions. That's, that's a good oh, deal. Yeah. That's right. All of the money, that's where all the problems are. That's right. Well, uh, so General, another question that's come in is uh, th whether you have any thoughts, this is from Mick on Facebook, whether you have any thoughts, this one might be a bit sensitive, on General Mattis and the other generals in the Army disparaging comments about uh, President Trump and about you know, uh, his suggestion that perhaps the military could be used in this situation. Yeah, I, uh, look, I respect General Mattis uh, and General Kelly uh, both uh, for the years of service that they gave to this country. And I, in no way do I want to denigrate their years of service. But I think they're both dead wrong on this issue. I don't agree with them. Um, and I think that uh, both of them probably have a little ax to grind with our president because uh, they both left the administration probably a little prematurely. That said, I, I reiterate that I have a, a great respect for the years that they spent serving the nation, but uh, I, I, I think they're dead wrong here. Well, you know, that's a good example, General, that you can disagree with somebody without calling them of the devil or <laughs> something mm -hmm. like, you know, we want all of them dead. That's some right. Of the way that some of these protesters are doing, so it's a good response. That's right. Well, uh, David on Facebook says, what other steps do you think the president can take to have the governors act instead of using active duty military? We talked about the National Guard, but the president can't activate the National Guard. What else can he do? Well, he can activate the National Guard. He can federalize the National Guard at any time. He sure can. But that's not the answer either. That, then you just have active duty military, even though they, you know, on a daily basis, they're in the Guard. No, I, I think the answer is that these governors these governors have to use the National Guard to support and, and back the law enforcement in these uh, cities where so much of this rioting and all is taking place. The National Guard is trained to do this. The National Guard trains routinely for civil disturbances. It is one of their primary missions, civil disturbances. They've been called out repeatedly. But I don't want to see the president federalize the National Guard uh, and, and use them, for example, to make a, a six block sweep through Seattle. But if it comes to that and there is no alternative and this, the mayor and the governor can't deal with the situation, then the president's going to have to intervene. Does he have any leverage with the governor and the mayor? Um, well, I, no, I, I, he has, uh, certainly has uh can withhold funding on certain things uh which he has threatened to do previously over different issues you can withhold funding for roads and and other civil projects and that type of thing if, uh, so if the, you find uh, their behavior unacceptable but uh yeah it's tough because they're elected by the people of those states well, that puts them in a situation where if they won't cooperate and just allow this thing to get out of control, it doesn't leave him but with one choice to be able to intervene. That's right. That's pretty tough. Yeah. Well, General, one of the things that uh, has uh, benefited the left from all this riot is it's captured the news and people aren't paying attention to what's going on with respect to the uh, investigation of the FBI in the whole uh, situation with General Flynn and the Russia collusion hoax and all of that. Do you have anything to tell us about what's been going on in that area? Well, I tell you what, I, Flynn is a, is a friend of mine and I, he was probably the best tactical intelligence officer that I saw in 36 plus years. And he's a good man. Uh, he was set up. Flynn was absolutely set up. And now you got a situation where you got a judge that is, uh, I, I don't know what motivates this guy Sullivan. I, I don't quite understand it, but when the Justice Department says, we think you should throw this out, throw this, throw this ruling out, and he absolutely digs his heels in, come on, judge, the Justice Department, which is full of attorneys and investigators, they investigated this. They're not just saying this out for political reasons. They investigated this and saw that this guy was not given due process. He was told he didn't need a lawyer before they questioned him to begin with. Hey, that's called the Miranda Act, if I'm not badly mistaken. And, uh, and now the judge has dug his feet in or his heels in. And I just, 
I think that ultimately Mike Flynn's going to be uh, exonerated on this, but let me tell you, he's lost just about everything as a result of uh, the uh, the financial burden on him and his family uh, in his retirement years here. So, General, let me ask you this. Why did he plead guilty to lying on two counts? Was this entrapment or a plea bargain, or how, how did that happen? I don't know. Uh, he did lie. I mean, he lied to the vice president, and, and he lied to the FBI. He did. No excuse for that. I mean, that's just a, that's a, that's an issue of honor. That's an issue of integrity. But should that, given what the FBI did in denying him his rights under the Miranda Act, should that put him in prison? And I, in my view, it should not. And he, he got bad counsel, very bad advice. And then he wanted to withdraw that guilty plea and, uh, and they wouldn't let him do it. But uh, I can't tell you what his counsel told him or how they advised him, but it was very bad advice, apparently. Well, that helps clarify some things mm -hmm. with me because I hadn't heard it that straight, so yeah. I, that's good. Time for one more question. One more question. Well, this one uh, is, a, is a little bit of a doozy. Not sure you can do it in two minutes, but it's, what would you say to white people who are apologizing for being white and having privileges or to this whole white privilege issue? Yeah, you know, I'm kind of disgusted with this because so many of these white people that are out there doing things are doing it to make themselves feel better. But you're not doing one thing to help with the with the reconciliation, which is really, you know, listen to Alveda King sometimes. Yeah, I mean, there's a, she's a dear friend of all of us. And she truly wants to see racial reconciliation. But you can't just go out there and march in the street with uh, Black Lives Matter and think that you've done something great for racial reconciliation. And even in the church, even in the church, we want to go and it's like my friend Bishop Larry Jackson says, I've had my feet washed so many times, I'm tired of it by white men. No, let's sit down, have a real dialogue, no kidding, a dialogue, and then let's see what we can do to really move forward in a substantive kind of way. And that doesn't mean invite a white man to your house, they're a black man for dinner or white man invite a black man to your house for dinner. I suspect we all do that anyhow. That's not what yep. it's all. Well, General, I hate to interrupt you, but we are just about out of time and CTN broadcast this. And so we're going to have to quit exactly on time. But thank you for being with us again. Check out Family Research Council. Uh, General Boykin is an executive vice president there. There's resources there. You can get his book and you can get all of these things about biblical worldview and it'll be really, really good. So you're a blessing, brother. I'm looking forward to thank being you. with you again. And thank I'm all of you good. for joining us. Thank you for being with us tonight. You can go to our website, truthandliberty.net, and we have a lot of resources too, and it'll be a blessing. We do this every Monday night at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. So join us then next week. God bless you. Goodbye. Join us next time for the Truth and Liberty broadcast. Find tonight's episode and related articles and links at truthandliberty.net. Truth and Liberty is viewer supported. If you'd like to help us continue our live casts, you can make a donation at truthandliberty.net.